Hello. Good afternoon. What an amazing day. I feel supremely honored and thrilled to be here. Thank you for having me, Dean Daly, and welcome parents and guests. And to all of you, the 2015 graduates of the USC School of Cinematic Arts, you did it. You survived those sleepless nights finishing your screenplays and TV pilots. You collaborated without killing each other on your animation projects and game design projects. And your 310s and 508s and 480s and 546s. You aced every single hazardous shooting form. <laughs> and you learned to mass delete thousands of old emails from Alex Ago. <laughs> from the finest film school on the planet. And good morning, distinguished faculty in your Harry Potter robes. <laughs> don't, you, don't you think these robes make you wanna, don't these, don't wearing these robes make you wanna wave a wand and cast a spell or something? Alohomora. Alohomora. That is the spell I'm told by the Harry Potter fan site that is the unlocking charm. It is designed to unseal doors upon which the locking spell has been cast. We could all use a spell like that in Hollywood. If you feel like I did when I was sitting out there not that long ago, about to receive my MFA, wondering what I was actually going to do the day after I graduated, this business could feel like a series of foreboding locked doors. Today, you will be handed a very fancy, very well-deserved diploma. Shouldn't that be your magic wand? For all you paid for it and all the work you've done, shouldn't you be able to just wave your diploma in the air and shout, USC Genius of Cinematic Arts! <laughs> and boom, the gates open, you walk onto a film set and start filming your first masterpiece, preferably based on a Marvel comic book. <laughs> Speaking of Marvel, I hear that your commencement speaker last year was Kevin Feige, president of Marvel. Since he's not speaking this year, it has to be the first time Marvel did not do a sequel. <laughs> After we graduated from this school, many of my friends did get writing and directing gigs in Hollywood almost right away, but the magic wands they waved to unlock doors were not diplomas. They were good, solid screenplays. You've heard this before, but you can't hear it too many times. If you want to be a director, writer, producer, game designer, animator, whatever, if you have a great script in your hands, you can wave it around exactly like a magic wand. It always amazes me that great scripts are still that rare and that powerful. But you may not be a writer. I was not a writer when I graduated. I wanted to direct. I had directed a decent 480, I got in a few doors, but without a screenplay, I got nowhere. You've heard so many stories of early successes. Today you've heard some about failures too, and I'm gonna tell you a few more in my own unique form of them. <clears throat> and it might be good to hear a few uh, of, of those failure stories because the success stories in a way are a curse. They raise your expectations, perhaps to an unrealistic degree, Right out of grad school, I worked many simultaneous jobs to pay the bills and kept learning. I taught cinematography here to non-majors part-time. I still lived just off campus on 30th Street in a small house with six roommates. I got a job as a camera operator for a day on a Roger Corman film. The scene was a pillow fight with strippers. <laughs> and I got an editing job on an industrial film about water pollution. The editing room was in the producer's downstairs bedroom in a small house. Ah, oh, the glamour. I was cutting on a steam back flatbed, though, with trim bins and film hanging all over the place. But the producer had this pet cat that loved to hang out in the editing room. A huge white fur ball of a cat. The cat happened to be epileptic <laughs> and deaf. He could only hear very loud sounds. He couldn't hear me coming, so I, if I made a sudden loud noise by accident, he would freak out, lock up into an epileptic fit, and then run smack into a wall, run up the wall, fall backwards, land on his back, the only cat I ever saw that could never land on his feet. <laughs> the white fur would flow through the air like snow. It was everywhere, on the editing table, in the gears of this precision machine, wound into my reels of picture and sound. And the cat wasn't the least of it. The producer also had a parrot. I swear this is a true story. <laughs> the parrot did not live in a cage. It just perched on the curtain rods in my room, pooping down the wall, watching me edit. <laughs> Until the flatbed, full of cat fur, would seize up, screech, the parrot would screech back at the machine and then dive bomb straight at my head. I'd duck, it would fly by, scaring the cat, who would flip out, go into another seizure, and go for the wall, fall back, the feather, and now the fur, the fur and now the feathers flying too. And 
not as fun as the stripper feathers. Platters of film spinning out of control. I got ulcers now. I get ulcers just thinking about it. But I kept cutting that film. I finished it. It wasn't terrible. Maybe the best water pollution movie ever edited. <laughs> and what a great cat video that would have made. If only the internet had been invented by then. Anyway, about eight people saw that water pollution movie. I was getting nowhere. I was failing. I told myself this was going to take a lot longer than I thought it was. This story is not to, meant to be a buzzkill, neither are Melissa's. It's just to sort of, maybe it's for the parents more than anybody else, because they want to they see their kids uh, succeed and are afraid of unrealistic expectations. But my story ends okay. Only after years of wandering in the wilderness, though, and that's part of what I want to do today. I actually want to give you some specific help to prepare you for the long haul. But as in, in any good video game, if you keep your eyes open, you may acquire along the way all the superpowers you need for success. Forgive me if I'm switching pop culture references now from Magic Wands, which I started with, to superpowers. I'm just trying to keep it current for your benefit. In fact, let me try a Game of Thrones reference. <laughs> Let's talk about accessing your inner Khaleesi, Mother of Dragons. <laughs> And yes, I'm talking to you, future female directors. As this week's USC ACLU study shows, it's time for a lot more female directors to unleash their dragons and blast open the doors to the studios. And you future male studio moguls, Starkies, I'm talking to you, just hold the door open and feel the heat. Today, to help you on your journey, I want to give you three suggestions to further develop your own superpowers. And again, purely for your benefit, I'm calling them three life hacks for life after film school. And to make them even more clickbaitable, I'm not sure that's a word. I remember, I don't, you know, I don't know the internet stuff that well because it wasn't around when I graduated. I'm going to give them catchphrases. Yeah, baby, is not one of the catchphrases. But I learned the catchphrases from the master of the Mike Myers. And the first life hack is failing with style. After graduating as the months went by, I tried to get meetings, I tried to write screenplays, but all I had to show for myself was the water pollution movie. I was still failing. After months of struggling, I was miserable. One day I decided I was done. I'd had it. I jumped on my old VW camper bus and just started driving back towards home to Albuquerque, New Mexico. I would move in with my parents. I drove through the night, in fact, and got well into Arizona when the engine in the back of my old bus caught fire. Not that big a deal. It was 20 years old, it caught fire all the time. <laughs> But I had to stop and put out the small fire with the already singed pillow I carried around with me just for that purpose. But because I stopped, I had to face the fact that I was running from my dream. What a loser. What a failure. So I turned around and drove back towards Los Angeles. But then partway back into California, I panicked again and turned back around towards New Mexico. <laughs> Crossed the border again, then I stopped, turned back into California, turned back again, turned into Arizona, shorter and shorter trips back and forth across the state border like this for hours. I was crying, snot was running down my face. Finally, I just stopped on the border, on a bridge, over a river, and cried my eyes out until the sun came up. It's a true story. I was defeated, and yet, I couldn't help but notice. It was so beautiful and mythic and amazing there on that bridge on the river in the desert. I thought, I am failing, but I am failing cinematically. <laughs> this would make a great, sad, funny scene in a movie. And that was it. The idea of learning to tell that story actually got me back to Los Angeles permanently. I got on a realistic program to turn myself into a better storyteller. I got a great writer's job as a writer's assistant in a writer's room run by a great producer and his partner, Penn Denture. That producer later became your great professor, Professor John Watson, sitting right behind you. I often say the writing assistant job is the absolute best entry-level job in the business. Better than being a PA, better than working as an agent, on an agent's desk, better than anything you can do because you're in that room all day, every day, with writers and directors and even stars sometimes, listening to people tell stories, and you're helping organize those stories into movies and TV shows. The next life hack for after film school I call benign delusion. Not unlike Melissa's a little overlap here. By the way, I know these catchphrases are not as funny as throw me a frickin' bone, but for example, throw me a frickin' bone. As, we, as, would, as, 
As movie writers and directors, our fears betray us. We delude ourselves into thinking we're not enough, that everybody else has more talent and better ideas, but as they say, you don't have to believe everything you think. Because a lot of what you think is delusional. It just is with your human being. Here's an example, jumping way ahead to 10 years out of film school after many more crazy job experiences and some great movies with John Watson, one day I meet Mike Myers by pure luck. We got to know each other, he asked me to read a script about this outdated English spy with bad teeth, I gave him a few notes, he talked, he liked them. Working for John and Penn, I got good at giving notes. I was not looking to Mike Myers for work, we were just friends, our wives liked each other. As a friend, he asked me one day if I could help him look for a director to direct his movies. So I'm calling through commercial reels on weekends, looking at first-time directors, as a favor, and he says to me one day, stop looking, I put you up for the job. Excuse me? He said, I like your notes, you have good ideas, so I put you up for this directing job, I scheduled a meeting for you to go in and pitch yourself at the studio. Now, I had not directed a, com a, a feature film, and I had no real experience in comedy at that time. I could give notes, but I didn't feel qualified to jump in at that depth and direct a studio comedy. But, don't overthink this, he said, you're, you're going to get this job. I thought he was insane, delusional. To this day, I do not, do not know what he saw on me, but I had nothing to lose. I thought, I'll try. I didn't have a demo reel, so I cut together using two VHS tape machines clips from movies I liked from the 60s. European pop art films, heist films, spy films, that had a vibrant, colorful style. Films like Blow Up, Danger Diabolique, The Tenth Victim. I knew Mike would be funny as Austin and Dr. Evil, but I had this notion that an exaggerated pop art directorial style itself could actually be funny. Right before the meeting, Mike told me, when you present this, remember, and this was huge for me, every word counts, every single thing you say is important. Enjoy every word like you're singing a song. You are not a performer, but you must perform this presentation. Oh my god, I was like, holy hell, I think my knees actually began to shake, that's not the way they talk about pitching in film school. I walked into the presentation scared to death. Twelve people around the table, producers, studio executives, everybody staring at me. The head of the studio, Bob Shea, opens the meeting saying in front of all these people, again, I'm not making any of this up, who are you? <laughs> Why are you here? There's no evidence for funny, you have no proven directing ability, we're not just going to hire Mike's buddy. I'm not kidding, that's what he said word for word, and at that moment I decided to absorb Mike's delusion. I can direct this movie. I can direct this movie. I said to Mr. Shea, believe me, I, or I said to you, believe me, I know that delusional shaking is not normally a healthy or wise choice, but if you are going to delude yourself, we are going to delude ourselves anyway with distorted negative delusions. Why not combat those with positive delusions instead of negative ones? I'm not talking about fake it till you make it. I'm talking about believing it like all the great actor do, do, uh, actors do. I'm talking about becoming your story. I was ready. I spent years studying comedies. I was a huge Monty Python fan. I knew how to shoot. So fully delusional, I said, I hear you, Mr. Shea, but I can tell this story. Let me show you. I told him what I thought mattered in this story. It feels like a fish out of water story since Austin Powers is frozen in the 60s and thought out in the 90s, but he's not a fish out of water. He brings his own water with him, his own shagadelic water, and makes everybody else swim in it. He brings love and color and fantastic music and funny dancing to the colorless, paranoid, fear-based world of Dr. Evil. I was channeling Mike's character here, but I was already directing that movie. And best of all, I inspired Mike. He became even more convinced I could do it. He fought like crazy for me and he just told him, don't call me anymore until this guy's the director. I got a call from him a few, late, few days later, I got a call from Mike. I could hear dogs barking and a lot of splashing. He had jumped into the pool, his own pool, with all his clothes on and he was yelling into the phone, you got the job, you got the job. <laughs> Thank you. That was a very emotional time. I started weeping when Susanna was helping with this this morning, but that, that made people believe I was a director almost exactly 10 years after graduating from this school. Yes, film school is only the beginning of your education, and along your way, like every great actor, would learn to create and live your benign delusion as a life hack for defeating fear and doubt. And finally, to my third and last hack for life after film school, this one, I admit, does not have a great catchphrase, but I hope it's still memorable. Found your own cult. This one applies to pitching your stories, and meetings like the one I just described are just to get into a meeting, but it goes much further than pitching, like I said. I know you, I know you take pitching courses here, but I, 
and we didn't have those, but I'm talking about something bigger than that. I'm talking about becoming the high priest of your story's religion, because that's what you need to do constantly to motivate people around you. It's about spreading a belief, a faith in your story, and the world of it, and all its details, and its characters, and its backstories, and its ancient history, and its future episodes. You have to know all these things in your soul, and have to prepare for this like a great actor. You become it, you believe it, and then you talk about it like your life depends on it. You have to form a cult wrapped in this story. You have to get people for a little while to stop caring about their own lives, their own stories, and, har and harness themselves into your cause and to become your apostles, your missionaries. Now, be careful talking about cults like this because it could get you on a no-fly list. <laughs> and this could obviously go way too far and you have to be very careful not to go from dynamic storyteller to pompous, blowhard, arrogant douchebag. <laughs> or worse, actually start to make it about you. It's never about you. It's about the story. Think of the examples of the truly great directors, Alfred Hitchcock, John Ford, Billy Wilder, modern ones like the Coen Brothers, Scorsese, Catherine Bigelow. They often feel like cult leaders in a certain way. Who is George Lucas but a fantastic, benign cult leader? Have you seen the trailer for Star Wars 7, The Force Awakens? I have because the film I produce, Sisters, with Tina Fey and Amy Poehler, opens the same day, in December. <laughs> That's a benign delusion. <laughs> and as I've learned, making the transition from studio comedies to smarter political films, becoming this driven religious storyteller becomes even more important. Try convincing someone to invest millions in a movie that, <clears throat> that, like the one I'm doing now, called Trumbo with Brian Cranston as Dalton Trumbo, a communist screenwriter. Although in a world where Kim Jong-un gets to decide what films get released, in America maybe I'm on to something. On the other hand, studio comedies may be the hardest thing on earth to hold together, because nobody really knows what's funny. Except maybe you comedy majors. I'm really glad they actually have a film school in comedy now. I almost can't believe it. Good luck. <laughs> Here's an example. Last, last little story. This still happens to me on the first day of every shoot, but one of the toughest situations I ever faced was on the sequel to Meet the Parents, Meet the Fockers. We started shooting that movie with no third act. Literally, the script ended on page 85. Every third act that had been written had been rejected by the studio or one of the movie stars with veto power. There were a lot of them. I had Ben Stiller, Academy Award winners Robert De Niro, Barbara Streisand, Dustin Hoffman, Blythe Danner. We had $80 million in a release date, but no third act. First day of the shoot, I'm walking to the step of my car down that canyon of trucks full of millions of dollars of gear being unloaded by dozens and dozens of veteran crew members. I pass the wardrobe trailer with the background actors lined up, the movie stars going in and out of the makeup trailer, all buzzing with excitement, ready to work. At least 200 surprisingly talented people who could be doing anything else, but they are here to, the work, to work on the story I'm directing. But I have no third act. What if the actors insist on knowing how this scene relates to the ending? I don't know. My benign delusion is not kicking in. As I get closer to set, I'm getting more and more stressed out. All these people are waiting for me to tell them what to do. I am no Austin Powers. My middle name is not danger, it's fear. <laughs> Even after directing several features, I'm tempted to jump in a car and drive back to Albuquerque. When, when I get closer to the set, I notice the porta potty. I stop at the door. I really want to run in and barf my guts out and hide in there all day long. What is the matter with you? What is the matter with you? This is actually just a trick question I still ask myself five to ten times a day, and it points me to this. What matters to you about this story? What is the matter with you? And suddenly I remember exactly what matters to me about this movie. I know who Greg Fokker is. I know what he wants. I know he needs Jack Burns to love his parents so he can marry the woman he loves and unite their screwed up families. And again, love versus fear, that's a story I can get religious about. So I walk onto the set and I shout, Good morning, everybody. Okay, let's rehearse. Here's where the camera goes. Barbara Streisand and Ben Stiller, you start over there. Robert De Niro, I think maybe start over here with Jinx the Cat. I'm watching you. Dustin Hoffman, wait behind the door until I say come out. And by the way, I have no idea what's going to happen in the third act, so don't ask me. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> now let's do this thing. I'll be right back. I just need to run to the porta potty. By focusing on what matters at every step, you can tell better stories, write better scripts, direct better scripts. And while today's streaming, with today's streaming opportunities, you can start your own story or religion tomorrow. Don't wait for an agent or a studio. By tomorrow, you could write a short script. By next weekend, you could shoot it. And by the end of the month, you could put an entire movie on YouTube. So what's the matter with you? 
I want to close by saying I love this school. The USC MFA program is a three-year program normally. It can be done in two. My five years here were among the best in my life. <laughs> 8186. Since then, Dean Daly has turned this place into a miracle. We should all be insanely grateful to her, to George Lucas, Frank Price, the hundreds of other people who, who have grown this place and enhanced this experience year by year. My God, we are lucky. I made so many good friends here who have kept, who have kept close to my trusted collaborators and confidants. My Austin Powers producers were Suzanne and Jennifer Todd. Suzanne produced my 480, and Jennifer was a student of mine in my class my cinematography class. My writing partner now is Larry Stuckey, an old USC friend. My visual effects wizard for every single one of my projects has been Dr. Dave Johnson, who just blew up a car for us during Greg Beeman's 480 when I was back in school. We had to drive it to Nevada to blow it up because Dr. Dave didn't have any pyrotechnics license in California. Thank God they didn't ask us to fill out a hazardous shooting form back then. I'm still getting to know more about USC grads through our internship program. Out there somewhere is Kyle Beller, our intern this semester. An excellent writer who's getting his MFA today. Alohomora, Kyle. I don't know anything, I don't know anything really about this business. None of us really do. We all pretend to in a benignly delusional way, but I hope you will try to keep track of what matters, try to learn to fail with style, and try to find found your own story's new religion and learn to access your own Daenerys Targaryen, or Jon Snow. For me, it's Tyrion Lannister. <laughs> if any of this meant anything to you, maybe in six months, you won't have to drive home and move in with your parents. Long live the USC storytellers. Congratulations, cinematic artists. I love you all. Thank you.